Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Leaders Podcast is a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network with interviews and advice on building your professional network, brand, and a purposeful second income from students, residents, and innovative professionals. Hey, welcome back. This is Pharmacist Real Estate Investing Part 2. And uh, what I wanted to take you through is kind of how I look at a property and how I look at things. And, and we'll talk in general about the market and some emails I get. So I, I go on Zillow lists and, and I look at some of the zip codes. And what I've done is I'm looking back over the last 20 years is that I find that I only invest in places that have actually lived. So it may be a little bit tougher uh, if you've never lived in a place uh, to know, you know how things are, but the, the rule of thumb is to rent for a year before you ever even think about buying a home in an area that you've never been in. Uh, it just, it's just so much easier. And then you know, I'm telling you that you should probably be a real estate agent first, learn what all that is, understand the contract, understand every single paragraph of that contract, understand what you're looking for in... Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what are the deficiencies that you're looking for? What are the things that you can take? What are the things that you can't? What kind of, how, what, what age of a roof are you looking for? What are you looking for when it term, comes to, you know, the, the HVAC? How much longer is that going to last? And immediately, you know, without even thinking, I'm going to the two most expensive. When, you know, you're, you're probably looking at, well, that, that was a really nice kitchen. And they had really great baths which are the things that, you know, buyers really look at. Uh, but in terms of things that are kind of hidden, you want to go in there and go look and see when was that HVAC put in. And you want to know when was that roof put in and things like that. So let's take a, a little bit of a tour. What we're going to do this week is we'll go to uh, Baltimore, Maryland, where I uh, went to graduate school in the, in the 90s, in 1997, and uh, I graduated from there. And a place that I lived for uh, two years, I feel like, uh, was Ridgely's Delight. It's a neighborhood just south of campus. Uh, it's walking distance to the medical campus. There are 5,000 students there. I think, well, there were when I was there. Uh, and there's the hospital. And um, I want to talk a little bit about this neighborhood because it was some place that I lived. And, and uh, yeah, anyway, uh, let me, it, it'll, it'll give me an ability to to project, uh, not project, it'll give me an ability to talk competently about the current offerings that are out there. And I'm only going to talk about two, uh, just so we don't make it kind of crazy uh, in terms of all the houses. Because if you just pull up 21230, I think it pulls up 540 listings. And 21230 expands all the way from Locust Point uh, up through Federal Hill, including the really expensive area of Federal Hill. Uh, up through Ridgely's Delight, and then across Martin Luther King Boulevard. Uh, and so it's a giant area. So when Zillow sends me, hey, 21230 as a zip code, I'm like, that is absolutely ridiculous. Because the difference in that zip code is enormous. Like if you go to you know Beverly Hills 90210 as a zip code, the average price of a home is $5 million dollars. But there are houses that are way above that, and there are houses below it. But in Baltimore City, the spread is enormous in terms of, uh, you know, the $8 million home that's available from Tom Clancy, and it's a really cool one, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but anyway, so let's, let's, let's first talk a little bit about uh, kind of how I got to this uh, decision to, to even record these two podcast episodes on real estate. So I'm listening to Revisionist History, and this is Malcolm Gladwell. It's a podcast that he does, and it's extremely popular. He's the guy that wrote, uh, I think it's like David and Goliath, and uh, talked about the 10,000 hour rule, and just a famous guy, and, and a great voice, great, really smart, smart person. And for this Revisionist History third season, there was actually a trailer. So uh, my first two things I was listening to were these two one hour long podcasts on Bigger Pockets, Bigger Pockets Money. And then I'm finishing up with Revisionist History as I'm finishing out the three-hour run. And uh, so Adam Grant's there with uh, Malcolm Gladwell. And these guys are both heavy hitters. And they're both very smart. And they're both on opposite sides of a lot of things in terms of social science. And so it's a great, you know, kind of 
a meeting of the minds. It's really, really a, a fun episode. But in it, Malcolm Gladwell talks about the ridiculousness of you know the test drive and how you could how can you possibly know if this is the car for you in X amount of time? And then they always make it seem like, all right, let's go for the test drive. Like in some way you could sit down and intuit that, yeah, this is the car for me. You know what? We don't even need to drive it. Don't want to waste your time. And so that's the thing I feel like with real estate is that so much we're like, well, I don't really want to bother the agent. I don't want to have to go to this many properties. And and then you're taking your time. And a very efficient way to do it is to be the real estate agent yourself so that you can go to as many houses as you want. And you introduce yourself. But the other thing is that you get to talk to the owners. And that's really where the the magic win-wins happen. Uh, when my wife and I came to Iowa, and I want to say it was 2009, so it's just post-crash. We're looking for a house, and we literally could not buy houses because... The people were un- upside down on the houses so much that that 6% that the real estate agent was charging was making the house so expensive we couldn't buy it. So we, it was middle of the night, 2.30 in the morning. I'm actually living at my mother-in-law's house, and I find our what's going to end up being our future house. And I went and I talked to them. And I said, no, no, no agent. We don't, we don't have an agent. Uh, but, you know, my father-in-law is an, an attorney, and uh, maybe he could help us with it, or certainly someone in his office could help us with the deal. And they're like, oh, oh you know, our, our, uh, our daughter's an attorney. Great, you know, we could do that. No cost there. And then, we, you know, we looked at the house, loved the house, uh, and ended up buying it. But if you are peopley, as uh, someone that I know that's a real estate agent in town says, if you are a people person, people will want you to have their home. So people have people never talk about this with investing, and I don't know why they don't talk about it. But in many ways, people want to know that the home that they've lived in, that they've worked so hard to make as beautiful as it is today, because there is no more beautiful day than you know people getting ready to sell a home, and they really want someone that's going to care for it. And if you're that person, you present yourself as that person, you're like, man, you know, I really wish I could buy this home, but, you know, as I look at it, I just feel like, you know, with the other things that we're going to have to do to, you know, the repairs we're going to have to make, I think it just falls out of our our reach. And then all of a sudden, they call you back like, you know, we really want you to have it. What if we drop the price $20,000? Would that be okay? You're like, what? what is going on? Does that really happen? And in our case, what happened was we went to because I was on it. We we went to the FISBO on the very first day that it was open. They're like, uh oh, we priced it too low. Somebody's here on the first day and wants it. No, no. I I I was looking. I was, you know, this was what we wanted. We knew we wanted you can the one thing that I, I, I won't forget is that like I think my wife could literally fit on the kitchen island like head to toe, like it's five feet long or some just massive sized island. And that was just something that she had just really wanted. So uh, anyway, but, but talking to the person is one of the huge advantages of being able to be a real estate agent. So if you are peopley, if you are somebody who is really good with people, then you may also be able to talk your way into it in a multiple offer situation where like, yeah, we really like that person. Because the person that is selling it just has to you know, take the offers, but they can pick someone with a lesser offer because they like them better. So there's nothing against that. Like nothing says that you, well, you know, my offer was on paper the best. Yeah, but I feel like you're going to be a pain in the butt to work with. And I don't want your money as much as I want this person who I think is going to love my home that I've worked so hard on. I've lived in my whole life. Or maybe it's a, you know, parent or somebody's selling a parent's home. And it's like, you know, I really want to know that the person that I'm giving my parents home to is going to take care of it. Uh, So such an important part of it, it's such an important advantage of being the real estate agent yourself when you're looking for a home. Um, Okay, so this was the weird email, or I felt it was weird, is that, you know, so I'm I'm looking at 21230, maybe I'm going to invest in, and I like Ridgely's Delight, and I know Ridgely's Delight, so it's a place that I'm competent. I'm also competent in 21224, which is Canton. Uh, To some extent, Federal Hill, but I never really lived there, and I never really lived in Locust Point, so I wouldn't feel as competent uh, in those areas, but 
I know 21224 and I know Ridgely's Delight. So if I'm going to invest in Baltimore, I know that, you know, I, I know what to watch out for. And this is, and so what Zillow says is that, the, that it's a buyer's market. The market temperature is cold. And I don't exactly understand what that means. I think it means maybe there aren't a lot of transactions happening. I, I don't exactly know what that means. But you want to think also, well, if I'm Zillow, do I want to tell the person that it's a seller's market and that, um, you know, you should stop looking? Or should I tell them it's a buyer's market? So I wonder if their algorithms favor the buyer's market. I just don't know. And what you're really looking for is, so it says that there was a 7.7% one-year change uh, from May 2017 to April 2018. And then from April 2018 to April 2019, they're projecting a 4.9% one-year forecast. That forecast is a complete, that, that is completely dependent on so many different factors. And to say that a whole zip code will go up is completely irrelevant to your situation because you only want one home in that zip code. So what I'm really looking at, as soon as I see that, or as a past real estate agent, I'm saying, huh, the increases are going down, or that we're seeing a leveling. So I'm saying, all right, well, I wonder if we're starting to approach a top of market here. And I don't know. I have no idea. I'm not telling you it's top of market. I don't know if it is or not. Uh, so 77 to 4.9%. And so the two homes, the first thing, you know, if you look at 21230, you see there's 549 homes for sale. Uh, and you've got to be careful because it's totally addicting uh, to start clicking uh, on these places uh, because you'll, you'll see like, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll see like these awesome homes if you click. Uh, instead of clicking cheapest, you click uh, like most expensive or something like that. And so, you know, one of the top ones is, uh, let's see, it's, Seven million nine hundred thousand dollars. Zillow estimates it worth nine million. So you're supposed to get a million. You know, you think, oh wow, you know, I make a million dollars as soon as I buy that place. But then you look at it and you say, all right, well, how long has it been on the market? It has been on the market for four hundred. I saw it somewhere. Uh, four hundred and fifty-three days. Well, that Z estimate doesn't look like it's right. Then, if it takes four hundred and fifty-three days to move something that's uh, seven million. Nine hundred thousand dollars, or that's supposed to be nine million dollars. Well, if it's a million less, then it should have sold, right? So there's some things here that you want to start intuiting and really use your your pharmacist brain and really use your, you know, like okay, what am I really seeing? Okay, it's a twelve thousand square foot home. Twelve thousand. That just boggles my mind. The pictures are phenomenal. Uh, there's four bedrooms, seven baths. Uh, it's very, I don't know, the views are spectacular and it just looks like, boy, that would be a, a really nice, nice home to own. Uh, but be careful because <laughs> Baltimore City taxes are brutal in terms of their comparison to the um, s county right next to it. So Baltimore City is usually double uh, what the county is for the exact same priced home. So that mortgage is $32,000 a month. Uh, looks like I can press a button and get pre-qualified for that. So that's cool. And that's Cummings & Co. Those guys are good guys. Uh, so I, I, uh, that's, that's just a really phenomenal home. All right. Uh, so let's go to the two homes that I'm going to talk about. And uh, let's see. Let me close this one. And then so what I do is, so we've got that 549 homes. So I go in and I start on Zillow and I start pushing in and then what I do is I use the little circle tool uh, and Ridgely's Delight is so it's on the east side Green Street turns into Russell Street then you go back up MLK and then you go back east on Lombard uh, oops I accidentally cut part of it so let's cancel it do it again okay so I lost I lost part of Paca Street there because I know that's a big part of it Okay, so let's go back, uh, do it again. Oh, I'm not far enough. So apparently, okay, so now I can do it. So I'm cutting all the way across Camden Yards is to the east so where the Orioles play and then come back up Martin Luther King. Okay, so now I can apply it. And now I go from 540 homes to nine. Okay, and that's a very manageable number.
Um, and so I'm looking at these homes, and I see one that's at 640 Dover Street, and that's the first one I'm going to look at. And it's 185000 so well within, you know, pharmacist salary. I mean, you're, you're talking about maybe being 1.25 of your salary if you're, you're at the average. Although I'm, I'm hearing the averages are closer to 100 now with offers. I don't know if that's true or not. Or uh, I've heard as low as 90, uh, up to 100. I'm completely out of that group. I'm in the bottom 10% uh, in terms of my, my actual salary. But uh, I don't use my license uh, at all, really. Um, and then 612 South Paca Street, which is $340,000. And, you know, on, on the surface, you'd say, all right, well, wow, one's twice what the other is. You know, it's, it's a no-brainer. You know, let's get the cheaper one. You want to get the cheapest one in the, in the best neighborhood. But the first thing that, uh, and you'll, you'll hear this on bigger pockets, is you want to look at square foot or price per square foot. And so if you, Zillow will do this for you if it picks it up right. And you want to be careful with some of these houses because a lot of them have additions that aren't included in, uh, in it. So you want to look at it and say, okay, well, let's, let's see. So 640 Dover, I'm looking at 296 price per square foot. That is right above the entry into Los Angeles prices. So Los Angeles is somewhere between 250 and 750 per square foot. So extremely, extremely expensive price per square foot. So me, you say, oh my gosh, that's not a deal. That's not worth it. But uh, I actually know these houses, and they're all set up in such a way that there's a bedroom upstairs and a bedroom downstairs. So although that's 624 square feet, it may be 624 above ground square feet. And that really matters because if the lower level is furnished in such a way as to make another bedroom, that means that you're probably actually looking at 900 square feet. And so the place to find what the actual square footage is, is you go to, S, I think it's SDAT assessment, uh, and that's Maryland, and then you can see the real property search. So you go into the county, and this is Baltimore City, not Baltimore County, and you look at a street address, uh, and then I'll use this, I'm going to use this three times actually today uh, for uh, the two properties I'm going to talk about, and then one I need... Uh, the property that I lived in, uh, to compare it so that I know what I'm doing. So I look at 640 Dover, and um, I see that it's somebody out of town that owns it. But I see that there's 624 square feet and 312 square feet in a finished basement. Okay, So what Zillow's not doing is it's not counting that 312 square feet. So if you add 624 to 312, you get 936. So 936, so then it's 180,000 divided by 936. If you want to do it price per square foot, price per finished square foot, which is $192. So all of a sudden, that changes things quite a bit. Uh, I have no idea um, if this is one of those one-way streets where you have parking on only one side. That would be kind of a concern. But I feel like, um, you know, and then you look at the price that they paid for it. It was about a 152.5 in 2012, so five years ago. So significant appreciation on it uh, from what they paid for it. Uh, but this, is a, this would be someone that if the price continues to push down, uh, it's only been on the market for two weeks, um, they would probably have give or there would probably be some room in there um, to offer something lower if, if again, this... There are just so few that open up in Ridgely's, but it might be something. But anyway, the, the first point is, is that when you look at Zillow, that's just a starting place. And that you see that the Zillow made a calculation on above ground square feet. And then you say, okay, well, are there finished square feet? And then, of course, you want to know, does it flood? And I don't know if those uh, Dover Street houses flood or not. Uh, so you would want to find that out. But those are the kinds of things that I'm looking at. And I haven't even looked at the inside of it. I haven't looked at a single picture and I know that that mortgage is probably going to be, what, like 800 a month. Uh, and then you've got taxes, though. But taxes there are really expensive. Uh, so you would want to really be careful with those taxes. And I want to say, uh, let's see. So let's see. On, on that much, um, do they have the taxes in there? They should. Um, yeah, I don't see it. And then you have to deal with ground rent. So you also want to find out if there's ground rent. And that's something that's intrinsic to Baltimore City where somebody might own the ground 
and it's a little bit weird, but that would be an extra cost for you to buy the ground back. And there are reasons to do that, and there are reasons to just leave it alone. Uh, but you would you can check out the uh, ground rent rege- redemption and the ground rent registration. But you can hear that I know a lot about this area, uh, and it's not the person's principal ev- residence, so it's it was maybe uh, an investment property for them. Okay. So the other one I'm going to look at is if you're going in. Why do I keep clicking these shut? Six twelve South Packer Street. It's four bedrooms, three baths, and on Zillow. And the reason I picked it is because it doesn't have the square footage on Zillow. So you go to the assessor. And you go to the street address, and you see it's 612 PACA. And anytime you don't see information on there, somebody might just overlook it because the information isn't there. And somebody might say, oh, well, I don't know how much that, you know, that would be worth. So I look at it, and I see you know, what, what it says, and it says it's 2,040 square feet. Now, from my living there, I remember that most of the ones on PACA don't have finished basements and I think it's moist in the basement, if I remember right. They, those were where the coal chutes were. So that you, would put the, you would bring the coal into the basement so they wouldn't finish something like that. that, that I just don't know. They, my understanding was that most people just pushed the house back and added something to the back uh, rather than that. The other thing that I would want to know, and let me see if I can see it from the pictures, is what the alley behind it looks like. So... Do they have parking pad? And it looks like they actually have a garage. Uh, and what I think they did with the space was they put a garage on the end of their land. And if it was me personally, I would probably, I would probably rip the deck off and I would rip and I would tear down the garage. Uh, if it was, if it was, so if I was going to invest in this as a rental property, I would rip that out because. I would want parking for all of my tenants. And that's something that they would definitely look for. But right now they've got it set up that it's got a, a deck on the back. Uh, looks like they've got some kind of table and chairs underneath it. And so maybe one or two people can park and the rest have to do street parking. But I would probably set it up to do uh, off street parking. And that stained glass is really cool. It looks original. Uh, anyway, it's so addicting. <laughs> Real estate's so addicting. Uh, anyway, so I would, I would look at that and i say, okay, well, 2,000 square feet, how big is that? And then I'd go, all right, well, I, I don't really know, but I do know that I lived at 607 South Packer Street, and I know that I could look that up on the SDAT and say, all right, well, let me see how many square feet I was living in then. And that was 2,700 square feet. So now in my head, I'm like, all right, well, I've kind of got an idea of how much it is, uh, how big it is, but I also see that, okay, well, in the 607 one, there's two finished uh, bathrooms, and they were kind of back-to-back. I would really look at that one-and-a-half bathrooms that that other one has and say, okay, well, is there a way I can create another full? Because I don't want four people sharing a single full bathroom, or do they have to do it? Um, Am I going to be able to get the plumbing on the back so that I could add a third or make it two-and-a-half bathrooms if that's the case? So a lot of things that I would look at. But anyway, all this came from you know, doing it and, and being part of the real estate community in Baltimore. And, and I think I was a real estate agent for, I want to say, five or six years. Maybe it was seven. I, I don't think it was that long. Uh, but I, I have a real understanding of, of what it's worth. And then, you know, I would do that, um, uh, you know, price per square foot there. And so I say, okay, well, I've got 2000 I've got $339,000, 339, one, two, three, divided by 2,000 square feet. Um, and so it's 169 per square foot. So per square foot, uh, this is cheaper, although it's a more expensive uh, property. Uh, I could get four people in there. I could probably create off-street parking, making it much more attractive. Uh, so there's some level of improvement, though, you know, tearing down a garage, some people would say that's crazy. Um, and then I could, you know, that deck, is that really serving anything? Do they really use it? Because it's off of, is it off of one room or is it off of a hallway? Like, is there like this master suite for this one person in the back? Uh, and then I would look at the windows, uh, because Ridgely's Delight, I think the rules are still there that you have to replace them with these expensive wood windows rather than the energy efficient ones. And then, um, you know, are there stars in the front of it or do I see buckling from the, the bricks? Like, these, these houses are so old, so it's about 117 years old, although the inside isn't, that 
sometimes the weight of the house itself pushes it out and you'll see stars on the front where they literally jammed a screw through the entire house and put stars on it and then they push the house back together to make sure that it doesn't buckle anymore. Um, so a lot of things to look at, but what I want to kind of impress on you is that, look, you just spent how many years in pharmacy school, how many years getting to pharmacy school, and now you're going to drop you know, two, three, four hundred thousand dollars with no education. And that, you know, at a minimum, go get a real estate license. Go look at at least, you know, 50 homes in the area to understand, you know, what, what, what's going on with the, the real estate there. What makes something valuable? What are some of the things that are happening? And then if you want to go way Ziggler on it, which is, you know, if you help enough people get what they want, you can get whatever you want. If you in a median home, if you if you look at the median price of a home, and if you make you know three percent per transaction, we're just saying, let's say two and a half percent per transaction of the value of that median, then you have to help forty people to you can have a home. So what I mean by that is, if you help forty people find a home at two and a half percent per, then you have grossed the median price of that area. So if you help 40 people find a home in Beverly Hills, you have probably uh, helped 5 million, you know, probably earned $5 million towards the home that you want. And obviously there's taxes involved and costs involved and all of that stuff. But I'm just saying that uh, you're now educated, you're now able to do it. And the last point I want to make is the FOMO, okay? Fear of missing out. Okay, so in 2004, the people at 611 South Pack, I think it was, let me make sure, so 611, try not to click this off and break it off. So 611 South Pack had bought their home for $330,000. Here it is, 2017, and they're selling it for $339,000. So it has appreciated $9,000 in 13 years. So the information that YFP always says is that, you know, you need to save 20% and all you're thinking is, oh my gosh, if I wait that long, I'm going to totally miss out on an up market. But you have no idea if it's an up market or if it's going to be a down market. And in this case, if you had bought in 2004, you would have had no appreciation. You actually don't, haven't gotten enough appreciation to even sell the thing because to sell a home, it costs about 10% of the value of the home. Uh, so you're talking about 6% to the realtor. And I know that there's different amounts that you can spend on a real estate agent, but let's just for easy sake. To get into a home, you know, you might need 5%, 20%, whatever it is. But then to get out of it, you need 10% of the value of the home that it's going. So we're not even talking about if it depreciates. So of this home, so, you know, if you're in it for 33000 and 10% of that is 33000 to get rid of it. So if you talk about that, you're looking at three sixty three. Uh, and then, so if they're selling at 339, they're already probably looking at, you know, right off the bat, you're looking at a loss of what, 121, uh, geez, why can't I do that math? Okay, so let's try again. It's 33 plus 330,000, you're selling it for 10,000 more, subtract 12, so $23,000. So you're losing $23,000 when you sell it uh, on the appreciation side because it didn't appreciate. Uh, but they may have paid into it, and then this all may have been uh, renters, and they may have paid down the, the mortgage a ton. I just don't know. But anyway, I uh, hope this was helpful. I know I went long on this second one, uh, but I try to, um, I'm just trying to give you some uh, tips on the things that you're going to be facing uh, as we're kind of going into this uh, very, very strange time when student loans are higher than they've ever been, uh, job are uncertain. The real estate market may be reaching some kind of tipping point. We don't know. We have no idea. And interest rates are way up uh, or they're going back up again. So uh, again, uh, you know, if this is valuable, please let me know. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, have a good holiday weekend and I will talk to you next week. Support for this episode comes from the audiobook Memorizing Pharmacology, a relaxed approach. With over 9,000 sales in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, it's the go-to resource to ease the pharmacology challenge. Available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon.com. In print, ebook, and audiobook. 
Thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag #PharmacyLeaders. Leaders. 